from around the globe. It's theCUBE, with coverage of KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2020, virtual. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and ecosystem partners. Hi, and welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of KubeCon, CloudNativeCon 2020 in Europe, of course, the virtual edition. I'm Stu Miniman, and happy to welcome back to the program one of the keynote speakers. He's also a board member of the CNCF, Vijoy Pandey, who is the Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for Cloud at Cisco. Vijoy, nice to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Stu, and nice to see you again. It's a, a strange setting to be in, but as long as we are both healthy, everything is good. Yeah, it, it, uh, we, we still get to be together a little bit, even though while we're apart, uh, we love the, inter the engagement and interaction that we normally get to the community. We just have to do it a little bit differently uh, this year. So we're, we're going to get to your keynote. Uh, we've had you on the program to talk about, you know, networking, please evolve. Uh, and been, been watching that journey. Uh, but why don't we start at first? Uh, you know, you've had a little bit of change in roles and responsibility. I know there's been some restructuring at Cisco uh, since the last time we got together. So Give us the update on, on, on your role. Yeah, so that, that's, yeah, so let, let's start there. So I've uh, taken on a new responsibility. It's uh, VP of Engineering and Research for a new group that's been formed at Cisco. Uh, it's called Emerging Tech and Incubation. Alyssa and Tony leads that and she reports into Chuck. Uh, the role, the charter for this team, this new team, is to incubate the next bets for Cisco. And uh, if you can imagine, uh, it's natural for Cisco to start with bets which are closer to its core business. But the charter for this group is to move further and further out from Cisco's core business and take Cisco into newer markets, into newer products, and newer businesses. Uh, I'm running the engineering and research for that group. And again, the whole deal behind this is to be a little bit nimble, to be a little bit startup-y in nature, where uh, you bring ideas, you incubate them, you iterate pretty fast, and you throw out 80% of those and concentrate on the 20% that makes sense uh, to take forward as a venture. Interesting. So it reminds me a little bit, but different. I remember John Chambers a number of years back talking about various adjacencies, trying to grow those next you know, multi-billion dollar businesses inside Cisco. In some ways, Vijay, it reminds me a little bit of your previous company, uh, very well known for you know, driving innovation, giving engineers 20% of their time uh, to work on things. Maybe give us a little bit of insight. What, what's kind of an example of a bet that you might be looking at in the space? Uh, you know, bring us inside a little bit. But that's actually a good question. And I think uh, a little bit of that comparison is uh, all those conversations are taking place within Cisco as well as to how far out from Cisco's core business do we want to get when we're incubating these uh, bets? And yes, my previous employer, I mean, Google X actually goes pretty far out when it comes to incubations. Uh, the core business being primarily around ads, uh, now, now Google Cloud as well, but you have things like Verily and Calico and, and others, which are pretty far out from where Google started. And uh, the way we're looking at the, these things within Cisco is, it's a new muscle for Cisco, so we want to prove ourselves first. So the first few bets that we are uh, betting upon are pretty close to Cisco's core, but still not fitting into Cisco's BU when it comes to go-to-market alignment or 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 our business alignment. So one of the first bets that we are taking into account is around API being the being the queen when it comes to the future of infrastructure, so to speak. So it's not just making uh, our infrastructure uh, consumable as infrastructure as code, but also talking about developer relevance, talking about how developers are actually influencing infrastructure de uh, uh, deployments. So if you think about the problem statement in that sense, then networking needs to evolve. And I've talked a lot about this in the past couple of keynotes where Cisco's core business has been around connecting and securing physical endpoints, physical IO endpoints, wherever they happen to be, of whatever type they happen to be. And one of the bets that we are, actually two of the bets that we're going after is around connecting and securing API endpoints wherever they happen to be of whatever type they happen to be. And so API networking or app networking is one big bet that we're going after. 
Another big bet is around API security. And that has a bunch of other connotations to it, where we think about security moving from runtime security, where traditionally Cisco has played in that space, especially on the infrastructure side, but moving into API security, which is earlier in the development pipeline and higher up in the stack. So those are two big bets that we're going after. And as you can see, they're pretty close to Cisco's core business, but also very differentiated from where Cisco is today. And once we prove some of these bets out, you can walk further and further away or, or, or a few degrees away from Cisco's core as it exists today. All right, well, Vitroy, I mentioned you're also on, on the board for the CNCF. Uh, maybe let's talk a little bit about open source. How does that play into what you're looking at for emergent technologies and these bets? Uh, you know, so many companies that, that that's an integral piece. And we've watched, you know, really the maturation uh, of Cisco's journey uh, participating uh, in, in these open source environments. So, you know, help us tie in uh, where Cisco is in, when it comes to open source. So, yeah, so I think we've been pretty uh, deeply involved in open source in our, in our past uh, we've been deeply involved in Linux Foundation for Networking. Uh, we've actually uh, chartered FD.io as a project there, and we, are still, we still are. Uh, we've been involved in OpenStack. We are big supporters of OpenStack. We have a couple of products uh, that are uh, around the OpenStack offering. And as you all know, we've been involved in CNCF right from the get-go as a foundational member. Uh, we brought NSM as a project. Uh, it's Sandbox currently. We but we're hoping to move it forward. But even beyond that, I mean, we are big users of open source in a lot of the SaaS offerings that we have from Cisco. And you would not know this uh, if you're not inside of Cisco, but WebEx, for example, is a big, big user of Linkerd right from the get-go from version 1.0. But we don't talk about it, which is, which is, uh, which is, which is uh, sad. Uh, and I think, uh, for example, we use Kubernetes pretty deeply in our DNAC uh, platform on the enterprise side. Uh, we use Kubernetes very deeply in our security platforms. So we are pretty good, uh, pretty deep users internally in all our SaaS products. But we want to press the accelerator and accelerate this whole journey towards open source quite a bit moving forward as part of ETNI, Emerging Tech and Incubation as well. So you will see more of us in open source forums uh, not just CNCF, but uh, very recently we joined uh, the Linux Foundation for Public Health as a premier foundational member. Dan Cohn, our, our old friend, is actually uh, chartering that, that initiative. And uh, we actually are big believers in handling data in ethical and privacy pre preserving ways. So that's actually something that enticed us, enticed us to join uh, Linux Foundation for Public Health, and we will be working very closely with Dan and the foundational companies there to not just bring open source, but also evangelize and use what comes out of that forum. All right, well, Vidray, I th think it's time for us to dig into your keynote. Uh, we've we've spoken with you in previous KubeCons about the uh, you know network please evolve uh, theme that you you've been driving on, and big focus you talked about was, was SD WAN. Of course, anybody that's been watching the industry has watched the real ascension of SD WAN. We've called it one of those cr just critical foundational pieces uh, of companies enabling multi cloud. Um, so help us, uh, you know, help explain to our audience a little bit. You know, what do you mean when you talk about things like you you know, cloud native uh, SD WAN, and you know how that helps uh, people uh, really enable their applications in, in in the modern environment. Yeah, so I mean, uh, we, we've been talking about SD WAN for a while. I mean, it's it's one of the transformational technologies of our time. Where uh, prior to SD WAN existing, uh, you had to stitch all of these MPLS labels and actually get your connectivity across to your enterprise or branch. And SD WAN came in and changed the game there. Uh, but I think SD WAN as it exists today is application unaware. And that's one of the big things that I talk about in my keynote. Uh, also, we've talked about how NSM, the other side of the spectrum, is how NSM or Network Service Mesh has actually helped us simplify operational complexity, simplify the ticketing and process hell that any, any developer needs to go through 
just to get a multi-cloud, multi-cluster app up and running. So the keynote actually talked about bringing those th two things together, where we've talked about using NSM in the past in chapter one and chapter two, uh, chapter two. And I know this is chapter three, and at some point, I would like to stop the chapters. I don't want this to be like uh, like an encyclopedia of networking, please evolve. But uh, we are at chapter three, and we are talking about how you can take the same consumption models that I talked about in chapter two, which is just adding a simple annotation in your CRD and extending that notion of multi-cloud, multi-cluster wires within the components of our application, but extending it all the way down to the user in an enterprise. And as you saw in the example, Gavin Belson is trying to give a keynote holographically, and he's suffering from SD-WAN being application unaware. And using this construct of a simple annotation, we can actually make SD-WAN cloud native. We can make it application aware, and we can guarantee the SLOs that Gavin is looking for in terms of 3D video, in terms of file access or audio, just to make sure that he's successful and Russ doesn't come in and take his place. Well, I, I expect Gavin will do something to mess things up on his own, even if the technology uh, work, work, works flawlessly. Um, you know, Vidroy, the, the, the modernization journey that customers are on is a never-ending story. I understand the chapters need to end on uh, the, the current volume that you're working on, um, but you know, would love to get your viewpoint. You talk about things like service mesh. Uh, it's definitely been a hot topic of conversation for the last couple of years. You know, what are you hearing from your customers? What are some of the kind of real challenges but opportunities that they see uh, in today's cloud native space? In general, service meshes are here to stay. Uh, in fact, they're here to proliferate to some degree. And we are seeing a lot of that happening where uh, not only are we seeing different service meshes coming into the picture through various open source mechanisms, uh, you've got Istio there, you've got Linkerd, you've got uh, various proprietary uh, notions around control planes like App Mesh uh, from Amazon. There's Console, which is an open source project, but not part of CNCF today. Uh, so there's there's a whole bunch of service meshes in terms of control planes coming in. Envoy is becoming a de facto sidecar data plane, whatever you would like to call it, uh, de facto standard there, which is good for the community. I would say, uh, but this proliferation of control planes is actually a problem. And I see customers actually deploying a multitude of service uh, meshes in their environment, and that's here to stay. In fact, we are seeing a whole bunch of things that we, we would use different tools for, like API gateways in, in the past, and those functions actually rolling into uh, service meshes. and. So I think service meshes are here to stay. I think uh, the, the diversity of service meshes is here to stay. And so some work has to be done in bringing these things together. And that's something that we are trying to focus in on as well, because uh, that's, that's something that our customers are asking for. Yeah, yeah, actually, you, you connected for me uh, something I, I wanted to get your viewpoint on. Uh, you know, go dial back, you know, 10, 15 years ago, and everybody would say, oh, you know, I, I really want to have a single pane of glass to be able to manage everything. Um, Cisco's partnering with all of the major cloud providers. Uh, I saw, you know, not that long before this event, uh, Google had their uh, uh, Google Cloud show uh, talking about the, the partnership that, they, that you have with uh, Cisco with Google. Um, you know, they have Anthos. You look at Azure has Arc. Uh, you know, VMware has Tanzu. Uh, everybody's talking about uh, really the kind of this multi-cluster management uh, type of solution out there. Um, and you know, just want to get your, your viewpoint on this, Vjoy, as to, you know, how, we're, how are we doing on the, on the management plane? Uh, and wh what do you think we need to do as an, indust as an industry as a whole uh, to make things better for customers? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, this is where I think we need to be careful as an industry, as a community. Uh, and make things simpler for our customers. Because like I said, the proliferation of all of these control planes begs the question, do we need to build something else to bring all of these things together? And I think uh, the SMI 
a proposal from Microsoft is bang on in, on that front, where you're trying to uh, unify at least a consumption model around how you consume these service meshes. But it's not just a question of service meshes, as you saw in the SD-WAN announcement back uh, in the Google uh, discussion that you just, uh, or uh, Google conference that you just uh, referred. It's, it's also how SD-WANs are going to interoperate with the services that exist within these uh, cloud silos to some degree. And how does that happen? And there was a teaser there that you saw earlier in, in the keynote where we, 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 are, we are taking those constructs that we talked about in the, in the Google conference and bringing it all the way to a cloud native environment uh, in the keynote. But I think the bigger problem here is how do we manage this complexity of disparate stacks, whether it's service meshes, whether it's development stacks, uh, whether it's SD-WAN deployments, how do we manage that complexity? And single pane of glass is overloaded as a term because it brings in these notions of big monolithic uh, panes of glass. And I think that's not the way we should be solving it. We should be solving it towards uh, using API simplicity and, and API uh, interoperability. And I think that's where we as a community need to go. Absolutely. Well, Vidroy, as you said, you know, the, the API economy should be able to help on these, uh, you know, multi, uh, the, the, the service architecture should allow things to be more flexible and give me the visibility I need without trying to have to build something that's, that's completely monolithic. Vidroy, thanks so much for joining. Uh, looking forward to hearing more about the big bets coming out of Cisco and uh, congratulations on the new role. Thank you, Stu. It was a pleasure to be here. All right, and stay tuned for lots more coverage of theCUBE at KubeCon, CloudNativeCon. I'm Stu Miniman, and thanks for watching.